Okay, well, good morning and welcome to our special session on the circadian clock, talking about people who do shift work. And actually, when we were setting up the uh, flyer for this, I asked the young lady, I said, okay, you write that, the circadian clock, and then when we put the subject, we'll say sleep rhythm. So nobody gets off put by it. <laughs> so, but as Tomoko, Dr. Steen mentioned, um, it's a very important topic. It's become really, and I'm happy to see two of our police officers here because they certainly um, can personally attest to the impact of shift work on function and just general well being. And we have several uh, other groups of people. Some of our people who work in IT here at the library would have that same problem. Some of our architects of the Capitol, uh, employees who are here around the clock. And just in general, some of the other people who have a big problem with it and actually present a public health issue are people like in the transportation industry who drive around the clock and then they try to make up time, but then they have to stop. And it, it just creates a big problem. So I know Dr. Smolensky is going to just address all these issues for us and just bring us up to that, <laughs> up to date on what, what it really does mean for us going forward and the impacts that it has on our lives and our functioning. So I'm very happy to welcome you. I'm Dr. Charles, as I said, the Chief of the Health Services Division and the library's physician, and I'm always so happy to have these speakers. Tomoko, Dr. Steen, and I from Science, Technology, and Business, we collaborate on these programs, and they have been so very welcome and so very informative. And I get to live vicariously through her various international meetings and rubbing shoulders with various Nobel laureates, <laughs> and I just think that's wonderful. And uh, from a library point of view, you know, we have so much in our collections about these different topics, and we are trying to bring to our employees as much as we can of what's going on around that actually it affects them whether or not they're aware of it. So this is indeed a pleasure for me. So I will ask Dr. Steen to introduce our speaker, and we'll get the ball rolling. So thank you again for coming. Uh, before we introduce the speakers, um, I'd like to mention that we had a successful two e events uh, in August, and uh, one was the health fair and uh, how to manage pain, and also the uh, lecture by uh, Professor Amari from Georgetown Medical School, and she talked about uh, how to manage pain with alternative medicine way. and. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so there was a Nobel Prize was given on this topic, but uh, probably you know not too many people know what the exact circadian clock is, and we are so lucky to have the you know great translator of the <laughs> circadian clock to uh, talk to us, and. Um, you know, he is very busy, but uh, he just gave a talk at FDA and came here also. <laughs> so uh, we, are, we are very fortunate. Uh, Professor Smolensky is uh, currently at the Department of Bioengineering at uh, UT uh, Medical School, Austin. And um, he had uh, several decades of work at the uh, UT uh, Medical School, Houston, the public health department. And he moved to Austin and uh, he thought that he's uh, retired, but uh, he's continued to do very active work from a variety of topics, uh, including uh, you know biomonitoring type of work as well. So after this, if you have some questions of camera, maybe you can ask questions also. And uh, he's really indeed polymath, and uh, he worked on a variety of projects, uh, including uh, you know climate impact to uh, your health, and um, as well as uh, toxic effect on your health and so on. And uh, today's topic is uh, circadian clock and shift work in the 21st century. So how uh, we, you know, this is an old concept from 1800, but now, you know, with a more ever busy lifestyle, you know, how we manage it, that's he's going to talk about. So before further ado, please join me welcoming Professor Smolensky. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me back okay? Um, thanks for both of you for the kind introduction. And uh, uh, let me just say I've been working in this area for longer than I want to say, but at least uh, 50 years. And uh, I didn't set out to be a, a chronobiologist, a person who studies biological rhythms, but it came to me because of various problems that I came upon in doing my own medical research as well as dealing with people and industry and so forth. So I'd like to share with you um, uh, some of the, um, how should I say, concerns uh, that we have in dealing with people who do shift work or not standard work. And so today I'll do my best to give an introduction or uh, overview and a meaningful one of the health and cycle uh, uh, psychosocial challenges of doing shift work. Now, the first question is, what is shift work? And uh, uh, this particular slide uh, that I took off uh, the internet uh, shows that there can be uh, seven types of different shift work. Um, perhaps uh, most of you may be uh, familiar with the fixed day shift, where you go every day to work uh, and work between eight or nine and five and six. and. Uh, that's a day shift, but there are also a great deal of uh, individuals who work uh, fixed night shifts. So they are active, uh, they're sleeping during the day and they're working throughout the nighttime. Uh, there's also flex time shifts. There are people who um, uh, will come in and work uh, in a flexible work schedule that may not always be during the daytime. It may be in the evening hours and at times it may be during the overnight hours as uh, need be both by the choice of the employee or the employer. And then there's the uh, home workers, uh, which are more and more the case with the millennials, but also uh, all generations now, where um, instead of people going out and leaving the house and going to a workplace, um, they can work in their pajamas uh, starting at four in the morning, uh, have breakfast, take uh, coffee, whatever, and unfortunately, uh, continue to work uh, into the late hours or early morning hours and those who are in the um, uh, business world and have interactions with people in different time zones in Europe or Asia are actually doing a kind of uh, shift work uh, without even leaving their own uh, apartment or residence. Uh, then you have um, uh, on the bottom row annualized hours. This is a S, that's an that's a Australian slide. Uh, where people have to um, get in a certain number of hours and so they may pile them up at uh, odd hours during the night and so forth and not during the day. Uh, and then probably the most popular uh, uh, shift is the rotating shifts. Uh, those are usually but not always eight hour shifts. And uh, generally uh, we talk about the morning shift that may go from anywhere from 6 a.m. to to maybe uh, 3 or 2.30 or so forth with a break. Then there's the afternoon shift that follows, and then there's the overnight um, graveyard shift, as some people like to refer to it. And then it gets even more complicated because you have people who rotate from mornings to afternoons to nights, uh, which is more biological because, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Steen spoke about, the biological clock that was identified, most people inherit a clock that runs with a cyclic periodicity a little bit longer than 24.0 hours. So it makes it easier us, for us to stay awake late at night or, or shift our biological clock and rhythms for a, a later start time as we shift from uh, days to afternoons and evening that's more biologic. But then there are other shifts that are backward rotations where you go from working days, then graveyard, then afternoons. And that's usually more difficult to adjust to uh, uh, biologically. Then you have part-time shifts, and this is a, a perhaps a misnomer. You, uh, it's more like a um, split shift. Uh, for example, uh, bus drivers in, uh, in, in big cities. Uh, uh, some proportion work uh, two shifts. They may work from five, uh, five to nine a.m. Then they go home, and then they may—that uh, is the morning rush hour—and then they work the night rush hour. The same thing goes for school bus drivers uh, that drive uh, in the morning and evening. So they work. Uh, they have, may work eight hours or get paid for eight hours a day, but they have a split shift. And the same thing goes for restaurant workers. You know, they sometimes they're working the breakfast and the dinner 
And so they, they don't work straight shifts. It's kind of a part-time shifts. And, and it gets into the, uh, not only the early morning hours, but the nighttime hours. And then you have those who are reserve workers, uh, not necessarily military, they could be standby workers, uh, depending on the industry. And uh, they may be brought in at any time of the day and any time of the night. So there's, uh, just to give you some ideas of the different kind of shifts and with different uh, psychosocial and health uh, concerns for each type. So what are the, some of the common work, shift work schedules? Well, I've already talked about the fixed eight-hour shifts, and it can be forward and backwards. Um, there are some people who work 10-hour shifts. Uh, they may work uh, four 10-hour shifts and get three days off. Uh, some of these shifts came out of uh, the petrochemical industry, where the idea was to, with union and management uh, negotiations, where people could put their work place together and then have time for family and other hobbies and so forth. Unfortunately, um, with the 12-hour shifts that are in the next row, the 10 and 12-hour shifts, we saw people uh, getting second jobs. So they were even getting more fatigue and more health risks and psychosocial um, uh, compromises. And then um, we see uh, in the petrochemical industry in particular, and, and also in nursing more and more now, is that individuals may work uh, a, a sole 24-hour shift or consecutive 24-hour shifts without any real rest. Uh, for example, in uh, the Houston Ship Channel where we have um, tankers coming in, they have to be turned around to be filled up again. They have to be cleaned out for uh, gathering um, or, or shipping in other types of products. So there's a whole cadre of workforce that uh, go in and work in sometimes under very hot conditions for 24 to almost 48 hour straight hours to get those uh, holes cleaned and turn that ship around because time is money. Um, then I already talked about the split shift and the uh, flex time employee, uh, depending on what the um, employer and employee work out. So the question is, why do we even think about uh, shift work? Well, in the old olden times, uh, we had the bakers, we had the um, security people, which we have representatives here. Uh, night guardsmen, watchmen, what have you, which uh, were in small number, but worked the night shift uh, to prepare, um, to keep things safe in terms of security. And then in the bakers, they have the foods ready and so forth for the people who needed to buy it uh, when it was ready to buy it at the store in the morning. So we, um, but nowadays we have the critical services that need around the clock uh, manning or womening. Um, the police, we have representatives, are important, uh, the firefighters, the military, the healthcare industry, utility industry, transportation, as was mentioned, are some of the key ones that operate on a 24-hour basis. And then we have the manufacturing processes that are like continuous processes, uh, production lines. It's not cost efficient um, to shut them down. So they have to be maintained usually around the clock uh, for much more than eight hours, usually the full 24 hours. So we, we need people to, to be on the line to uh, for the continuous uh, production process. And that's because the machinery is so expensive that uh, we need to have people using it or else it becomes prohibitive for the products to be uh, purchased and uh, companies to make uh, a decent uh, a profit. And then you have uh, support services uh, for other shift workers. You can also talk about the hotel industry, the casino industry, resort industry. Nowadays, you've got the Lyft drivers, the Uber drivers, the taxi cab drivers. Um, so it's almost uh, nowadays fairly uncommon not to find people who are not doing uh, standard work, which we would call nine to five uh, uh, kind of uh, hours for work. So um, uh, I've kind of gone into this. Some of the other industries that uh, didn't fit on the other slide um, are the uh, public uh, would, would put in the ambulance personnel, the correctional personnel. I've already mentioned the staff, hotels, motels, casinos, uh, construction services. Uh, we have so many people using our roadways during the daytime that more and more contract work on uh, either um, constructing roads or uh, widening roads or repairing roads are done during the nighttime. And that's heavy physical work uh, uh, being done at a, a biological time, if you will. Uh, the ba bakery, uh, as I mentioned earlier, also grocery stockers and uh, Targets and other Walmarts and so forth, 
when you go to the store during the daytime, how do you think things get on the shelf? That's, that's the night crew. Um, you, I mentioned the school, city bus drivers, uh, splits, and the, and the restaurant staff. Uh, the, another big um, shift work uh, category are the media. Uh, television, radio, and other media. Um, the people who come on in the morning to give you your weather and the overnight news are generally reporting to work about four in the morning, which means if they have a transportation, they're, they're up at uh, 2.33 in the morning. They have a completely different social life as well with their family and their friends, and that becomes problematic. So basically, uh, we have also, as I said earlier, more and more people who are working at home uh, and doing kind of a self-imposed non-standard work schedule or kind of shift schedule because the hours may not be the same from one day to another. And uh, I know Tomoko has talked about having to interact with some conference that's going on in Asia, and I too um, have had to give remote talks for conferences, conferences of several days in uh, Australia, which required me to be um, uh, alive and um, functional and cognitively sharp at two to three o'clock in the morning, which is um, quite difficult. So uh, that's, that's becoming more and more common with connectivity that there's more and more people who are working strange uh, hours. So what is the actual labor force involvement in shift work? And this is really hard to know on nowadays. These data came out um, probably about 10 years ago, so they're antiquated data. And because we have so many people now who are working at home and are kind of doing assumed shift work, um, uh, so there are approximate figures. So in the USA, about 14 to 20 percent of, em of employees have some type of what I call non-standard work schedule, that is uh, not 9 to 5 a.m. And um, what's interesting is in the USA, less than 30 percent of the population that are workers uh, are following a five-day uh, work week uh, with a fixed day schedule of less than 40 hours a week. So that means most people are working more, to, more than 40 hours and they're working more than five days a week and they may not be working only during the daytime. Uh, the European Union is interesting because only 40, well, when, I know the economy is bad right now in Europe, but uh, um, uh, only 24% of the workforce is actually involved in, um, in, in a kind of work schedule that, that has uh, exemption from doing weekend work uh, or being exempted from doing fixed night work or doing rotating shift work or working less than 10 hours a day or working more than 40 hours a week. So we have a lot of our employed people who are not working nine to five that we really assume they are. And in developing countries, this is really an underestimate, some uh, 15 to 30 percent of the labor force is engaged in either fixed night work or rotating shift work. And that includes even school children and teenagers of developing nations. For example, in Brazil, a large proportion, or I won't say large, but a fairly large proportion of teenagers, are, because their families are poor, are working uh, late nights or even uh, night shifts. And in Brazil, in uh, Sao Paulo, they actually have schools that are shift schools, so kids who are working nights can go to school when they should be sleeping during the day or uh, late night, depending on what schedule they're working. So. It affects all age groups, both men and women, and uh, uh, it's really part of our everyday life now. So why do people work shifts? Well, many people say it's the nature of the job. If it's a continuous process job and you want to make a living uh, and you have no other opportunities, that's what you're going to do. And many people choose it voluntarily because they find it's better arrangements for the family or child, child care. If you have a two-worker family, uh, it could be the, the wife is working shift work and the, the guy is working the day shift uh, so they can um, really rearrange and have uh, a better interaction with either elderly or young children. Sometimes it's the only available job given the person's training uh, educational level. And sometimes it's a personal uh, preference. Uh, there are some people who are born with a biological clock that's really odd. They're, we call them night owls. Uh, or they're or larks, they like to, the night owls like to stay up late, and they uh, have a different kind of personality. They may prefer to do the night work shift and not the day shift. Then you have the other people uh, on the other end who are larks, and they 
prefer to get up very early in the morning. It's part of their biology. And they like to work the very early morning shift and not the night. So uh, there, are, there are many reasons. Uh, sometimes they're overlapping. But people who, uh, who <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, people say they love the night shift. They love shift work. And then you ask them some questions, and they can't tell you what day it is. So. Um, not everybody can do shift work, and not everybody should do shift work. Uh, individuals who have rather severe sleep disorders uh, that compromise the quality of the sleep are likely to have more problems doing night work and rotating shift work. Individuals who have diabetes who require a, a careful diet, uh, what you eat and when you eat, as well as the medication schedule. Uh, shift work makes it very difficult because when you're working during the night shift, you're eating at the, really the worst biological time you could ever think of in terms of uh, diabetic conditions. People who have epilepsy um, and uh, really require, uh, in severe, more severe forms, require a very tight medication schedule to be, be seizure free and not se have seizures around uh, machinery, um, doing a rotational shift work or fixed uh, night work can be problematic. Individuals with coronary heart disease um, or vascular disease is problematic uh, because of the extra stress in doing night work and sleep deprivation that we'll talk about later. Certain psychiatric disorders, especially melancholy or mood um, uh, depression, uh, because altered sleep, the sleep-wake cycle is tied very closely into good mental health and those who are already compromised can actually precipitate anxiety or severe um, uh, depressive episodes. And uh, other medication, uh, I should say other medical conditions requiring precise medication or meal timing regimens, um, probably those people should think uh, second uh, or third time uh, considerations before going into shift work. Mm -hmm. So um, when doing uh, night, uh, fixed night and rotating uh, work schedules that require, uh, they require special biological and social accommodation. And, and these are just a few, um, uh, it has to have a person who can tolerate biologically the continual alteration of the sleep-wake schedule. It sounds really fundamental, it sounds really easy. Uh, it's not easy, especially as we age. Uh, our sleep-wake schedule becomes less and less flex flexible and more fixed. Um, it includes tolerance of jet-like symptoms, uh, even though you're not getting in a jet airplane and flying over time zones. You're doing kind of a, if you will, a social jet lag. You're, you're uh, changing your sleep-wake cycle as if you were traveling uh, from Washington, D.C. to London or France uh, every week back and forth. And uh, that gets pretty old fast, and it takes a little while to adjust. Uh, the circadian, we call it time structure, our 24-hour rhythm time structure, does not adjust right away. Uh, it takes sometimes a week. So people may be adjusting by the end of their night shift, only to then go back to a day shift, and then they're just going back and forth. And, and some, there may be some accommodation, biological accommodations or acclimatization to that kind of schedule with time, but we're not sure if that really does occur. Um, uh, there's the ability, people have to be able to um, tolerate frequent sleep deprivation, short sleeps, uh, sometimes as short as four or six hours on the, on the shift day uh, from the rest of the shift day the first night uh, with uh, the experiencing of uh, excessive fatigue and how to deal with that. And it depends on the kind of job, if you're in nursing or medicine uh, or you're in an exact type of job where you have to have good reflexes, make good decisions on, on what to do in the real, real world scenario. Uh, working the night shift uh, is, um, I'll talk a little bit later, is, uh, is at a time of real slow decision-making reaction time and, and working memory issues. And so we're not the same, we don't have the same capacity to make decisions. We don't have the, the same uh, cognitive reasoning skills that we do, not just because we're sleep deprived, but because our, our circadian rhythms govern even how we, uh, how we learn, how we think, and how we react, and how, what, what processes are called in efficiently. Um, then there's the issue, of, I already mentioned, the cognitive and physical performance stress at, at an atypical time when we should be asleep, but we're now found at work. And I mentioned earlier um, meal consumption at atypical biological times. In many industries, 
really don't even have cafeterias to choose decent food from. They have machines, a lot of carbohydrates, a lot of bad, yeah, yuck. And, uh, and actually, what happens when, when people are doing the night shift, uh, I don't think it's well recognized, and they're sleep deprived, the biology has a compromise uh, response, and it, has, it motivates our, our brain to seek uh, carbohydrate-rich foods and snacking behavior. So if we actually, we actually did, did studies on people working the night shift versus the day shift, and it's, it's like a rodent in the field. They're just snacking on carbohydrates, either brought in the lunch box or the, their own, uh, own, own a food um, bag, or they're going to the, um, the, the um, uh, vendors, vendor machines and buying uh, snack foods, which are not really healthy. And um, the other problems uh, is really the difficult work-life balance pressures. Uh, people who have families, children, wife, elderly parents, uh, having enough time to do the job at night and they're getting at home and supposed to be sleeping to be able to do your job. But then uh, there's social events going on, sporting events, the family members express, expect to have some interactions or they need them. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's really, a, a, it takes a special person to adjust to that. So I don't want to go into a lot of detail. Um, the, the, bi the biological clock was discussed in the introduction. And uh, we inherit a biological clock in our brain. It's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's not very big. And it has neural connections to the pineal gland, which secretes the hormone melatonin. Melatonin, you can get over the counter these days, but it's produced biologically only at night. And melatonin does many things. It helps us sleep at night, but it also protects us from inflammatory conditions and free radicals. And it also helps to fight precancerous conditions. And um, this whole clock system is uh, synchronized for our ancestors by the time of daylight alternating with darkness. So sunrise and, and sunset our ancestors was, hey, that's when we're active, we're a diurnally, diurnally active species. And when the sun goes down, melatonin comes up and it says, hey, it's time to go to bed. And, and melatonin's circulating all over the body and says to all of our organ processes, our brain functions and our cells saying, hey, slow down, it's nighttime, it's time to rest and repair. So um, when we're doing shift work, we're seeing light at different times of the day and night artificially, especially at night artificial light with our electric light practices. And that plays havoc with our biological clock and the production of melatonin. And we'll talk about the consequences of that. So in reality, what we have is, if we look around the room, we have a biolo biology that's organized in space. And left, you see a nice anatomy with organs, lungs, etc. cetera. And, and uh, on the right, we have a uh, an organization of our biology in time is biological rhythms of 24 hours. I won't go into menstrual or monthly rhythms and annual rhythms and other period rhythms. I'll restrict the talk to just the 24 hours to keep it straightforward. And if you start measuring uh, and, and taking blood samples and measure for melatonin, you can see the tremendous variability in melatonin as a hormone. Uh, the bottom row shows plasma cortisol. That's another hormone pr produced by the adrenal cortex that um, is important for our uh, uh, dealing with stress, physical and mental, and also metabolic uh, uh, functions. And then even core temperature, our body temperature shows a nice circadian rhythm in spite of the temperatures showing a 98.6 if you live in America, or I think it's 98.8 if you live in the UK and Europe. So. Um, what I'm saying is all our biology is really well organized in time and it's synchronized in its phasing so we're very efficient in space and time and when you do shift work all of a sudden you've turned not your physical anatomy upside down but your biology upside down and that is really the crux of jet lag. So if you took a circular clock di diagram and this is uh, quite a bit of information but it's just to be illustrative and you looked at the normal sleep at night and wake span during the day, and we just uh, indicated at different times, like a clock function, the peak time of various variables that, just to give you an illustration, 
what things are peaking when during the 24 hours and, and, and how you get an idea of how we're organized in time. But if you do rotating shift work, all of a sudden all this gets messed up because each biological function doesn't shift with the same rate constant. Each biological function has its own rate function, so you get everything disorganized and you have a really inefficient biology during the adjustment phase. So the real problem is then is that um, um, when we are uh, doing the usual work situation, let's say nine to five, work coincides with the nat uh, natural diurnal activity span in sync, if you will, with the normal circadian time organization. So here you have the bottom waking time corresponding to work on the above panel, and then you have sleep, that's off time, and that's really nice because it fits in with our circadian rhythm structure. So the problem again comes in when we're doing shift work, and that includes a night uh, domain, where you have then um, uh, people during the night, indicated by the upper bar and, and black background, working, and that's now wake time, and off time is now during the daytime when you're supposed to be sleeping after you get into that shift, and then the circadian rhythms are scrambled. So. Just to give you a quick demonstration, this is a study done in Minnesota. It's only an N of one, but here's the plasma cortisol rhythm of 57 <coughs> day shift nurses and medical technologists, and in this case, one night shift uh, volunteer uh, who was willing to uh, undergo uh, blood tests at regular intervals. And you see that the whole rhythm for the night shift work and worker is completely reversed for this function as is the lymphocyte white, white, white cell function. So everything is reversed on an adjustable person, uh, an adjusted person to the night shift. So uh, that gets us to the real crux of why I'm here. What is the consequences of people doing shift work? Were they doing it for an employer? Or were they doing it for themselves working at home uh, in a self-employment or, if you will, even working for an employer but working in one's home. So there are short-term issues. Uh, I don't know if you'd call them real health, uh, there would be acute effects. Uh, it would be some people get uh, disorientated, uh, they get fatigued, they have health problems, um, uh, usually minor ones, but the type of uh, health problems are usually um, problems with um, uh, uh, Got, uh, uh, I should say, indigestion, um, problems with uh, constipation, um, things like that. Uh, sometimes uh, short sleep, interrupted sleep uh, with fatigue. The more longer term effects are going to be um, effects on increased risk for heart disease, uh, both because of doing shift work and also because of poor nutritional habits that accompany it. And very often, shift workers also tend to smoke and all kinds of things that add together. Uh, gastrointestinal disorders, peptic ulcer used to be a common, common problem with shift workers. Uh, now that you can get uh, over-the-counter Pepsid and other, other, other medications, uh, it's not so much a problem. Uh, sleep, uh, as I mentioned over and over, is a major problem. Psychological effects, especially um, uh, depression is common and also anxiety and also effects on uh, uh, pre-existing conditions that will be aggravated. Social effects are um, inhibited interactions with family and friends, and especially under the conditions of sleep deprivation. Very often things get pretty tense, especially with adolescent children who, uh, with a tired father or mother who's worked already 12 hours on a night shift, comes home to deal with an adolescent who has their own uh, issues. Um, you got problems, and it, it's common. And also that uh, the adolescents um, are uh, uh, kind of free-ranging when uh, single-family parents are doing shift work because they get away with things because they know what's going on uh, when they have uh, free time and when nobody's watching. And then there are issues about lifestyle and community activities that are, that are restrictive and that kind of work. So uh, the shift work schedule is compromised sleep, and it really results in... Um, uh, can result in significant uh, sleep uh, deprivation. And this slide, uh, not meant to give you graphs, but it just shows that the sleep duration between two successive shifts of the same kind or off uh, rest days for 297 workers. And so between two successive shifts uh, in this particular industry that was studied, um, the average uh, uh, 
uh, amount of sleep was six hours. That was the average for the workforce. But it was as little as two or three hours for some people and as much as seven hours for some. When working the night shift, the uh, early morning shift was a little better. But the afternoon shift was more like the rest shift because people have a more normal circadian time structure and a more normal life, if you will. So one of the big problems uh, when I was younger and doing some shift work uh, research on nurses, I would actually walk through the, um, the hospital uh, floors. Um, I had nothing else to do with my life. I became a shift worker. <laughs> so I'd go through at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning in the Health Science Center in Houston in the, in the teaching hospital. And um, this really was the situation. Uh, I'm not saying that all nurses are this way, don't get me wrong. Um, but it's, it, it's a hard life. Um, it, it's a demanding life. And uh, uh, in the United States, uh, unlike certain other countries, um, we don't like to pay people for sleeping at work. Uh, but really, uh, some other countries um, are using fatigue mitiga uh, mitigation strategies, uh, just like the airlines use it in Transatlantic and Transpacific, where they have time to go back and, and sleep in, uh, in a provided area. Uh, several uh, uh, industries at, and overseas are actually allowing individuals on the night shift to have uh, time for power naps or what have you. And that's probably, that, that is a good idea. Um, so um, some of the problems in shift work, um, uh, the shift work caused chronic sleep deprivation, and the consequences of that is increasing the resist, uh, the, the, uh, increasing uh, the risk for insulin resistance. And what does that mean? That means the um, uh, risk of developing metabolic syndrome and, uh, and diabetes. Uh, it's also uh, a big risk factor for, uh, would be associated that with impaired glucose regulation. And because people who are doing night work often either fixed shifts or rotation shifts and eating at a uh, really atypical biological time, uh, there's increased risk for obesity. And uh, it's not well known, but a lot of circadian rhythm studies have been done looking at not only what you eat, but when you eat. And there's a lot of fad diets saying you should break up your meals and have little meals throughout the, the waking span. Um, I don't necessarily advocate that because in our studies, uh, both on rodents and humans, I uh, used us, for example, the, wrote, uh, the human study was using army rations where you were given um, uh, subjects all the army rations to eat as a breakfast every day for one month and nothing else during the rest of the 24 hours. Or uh, on another uh, flip of that uh, arm of that study, eat the same army rations, which are not too tasty, but always as a uh, late dinner meal. So when people were taking the army rations and eating them for the month for the um, breakfast, people maintained their weight or lost weight. This is about 2,400, 2,800 calories, women and men. And when they took the same army rations and ate them at uh, bedtime, everybody gained weight. So because of the circadian rhythm organization, foodstuffs are handled differently. When you eat them in the morning, they're broken down and they're not stored. They're used for fuel for the day. When you eat your meals late in the day or overnight when you should be sleeping, that's stored. That's, gain, that's body weight gain. So a calorie is not a calorie in terms of uh, body weight maintenance. So a lot of shift workers, firemen, policemen, truck drivers, um, I've not seen a lot of really skinny ones, and it's not their fault. It's, it's what they have to do. To, I'm sorry, it's what they have to do. Um, there also is the issues of um, these uh, uh, conditions favoring then the development of cardiovascular disease, both directly from the unusual work schedule and secondarily from the metabolic alterations and the food pattern of eating. And then there's a high risk from developing cancers in men, prostate cancer, and in women, breast cancer, endometrial cancer men and women, colon cancer, colorectal cancer, and I'll come back to that as well. And certain other acute and chronic medical conditions, more and more we're finding now some liver, liver, liver pathology uh, because of unusual eating patterns, secondary to develop metabolic syndrome and uh, type two diabetes. And again, doing shift work, uh, especially with a night component is a very high risk factor for work accidents and injuries.
And here's one example. This is a study that I did with a colleague at the School of Public Health in Houston where we had a data, database from Nebraska in their workman comp, whoops, workman's compensation claim database looking at transportation and accidental injuries. And here you see across the bottom of the graph time of day in military fashion. So noon time is 1200, 1600 is 4 p.m., 2000 is 8 p.m. And you can see the night shift, day shift, and uh, evening shift or afternoon shift, if you will, labeled at the bottom. And you see that the occurrence of transportation accidents uh, by workers uh, who filed claims uh, in 1998 to 2002 is not randomly distributed throughout the 24 hours by, or by shift, but you see a preponderance of accidents that occur overnight because people make mistakes at night of judgment uh, leading to severe accidents. Um, I did a study um, of um, accidents due to falling asleep at the wheel because um, not only was I interested in um, fatigue-related accidents of truck drivers and passenger car drivers, but I was also uh, aware that people have to drive to and from their night work. And um, before work, um, uh, it's usually dark, and after work it may be sun sunrise, but they're fatigued. And so is there a, a, a pattern? And you can see quite clearly that the occurrence of falling asleep at the wheel is no surprise is greater during the overnight hours. And, and you can ask, what is the relative risk? We actually did um, road traffic um, density. So we're talking about tens of thousands of order difference in risk of having an accident overnight, relative risk overnight compared to the afternoon hours. So. Uh, even uh, uh, driving around at the wrong time is a problem. Um, severity of accidents also varies by time of day. We were able to get uh, information on the cost of uh, medical care per injury on workman's comp. Uh, this is a different uh, injury, uh, 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 job title. And you can see, and we've, we've reproduced these findings also in studying firemen, Firemen who have accidents also during the overnight uh, work uh, graveyard work shift because they're called out for either ambulance work or firefighting, just like in this graph, they're more severe, they're more costly than ones that occur uh, in the afternoon or early evening. So um, why do these accidents happen? Uh, certainly we have sleep deprivation and people are fatigued, but there also are high amplitude circadian rhythms in our ability to perform cognitive tasks. Our brain is organized in time. And just to summarize the slide very quickly, um, the magnitude of difference in our ability to perform in terms of reaction time, eye-hand coordination, and decision-making is equivalent to a blood alcohol level of about 0.9%, which is a low level inebriation, if you will. And so, um, and it's also equivalent to ingesting a five milligram uh, hexabarbital sleeping pill so we're not talking about trivial changes. So the, the, in terms of those uh, individuals who have to make snap judgments in terms of uh, stress or whether they be in security, whether they be in firefighting, doing ambulance work or whatever it may be, uh, military intelligence and the government, um, the ability to perform at the wrong biological time and decision making is, is a risk. Uh, and there are certain people who have less peak to trough variation, variation over the 24 hours, and those are people who are more uh, appropriate for, uh, for doing important uh, shift work that, that involves important uh, decision making. Um, and uh, those people can be selected out. We did some work on Navy SEALs. And Navy SEALs are, are something else. Um, they don't show this type of uh, variability when they're young. They're pretty, uh, we can get them up for 48 to 72 hours straight and do repeat and measure testing on them. And their amount of variability that they uh, have over the 24 hours and over that 72 hours that are sleep deprived and uh, forced to perform military act, uh, duties is incredibly consistent. But those people are quite rare. We're talking about run of the mill individuals. Now, Unfortunately, um, when you look at the major disasters that have been reported over time, and some of us older people remember, some of the younger people may not say, what is he talking about? 
But the, the Three Mile Island nuclear plant uh, disaster happened on the, um, the night shift. It was a slow response. People didn't notice and didn't react properly. The Chernobyl nuclear disaster was also during the nighttime, and it was uh, not uh, uh, monitored properly of some of the warning signs. The, uh, those of you who are old enough, there was a, um, uh, a chemical leak in India and Gopal um, that uh, was in incredibly uh, deadly to the surrounding population. That occurred during the night shift. The Exxon Valdez oil spill, which happened, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago now, was um, the uh, pilot was operating in the middle of the night under sleep deprivation and made poor judgments uh, and uh, got grounded and spilled a great amount of oil and had incredible ecological damage uh, up in uh, Alaska. Uh, the NASA Challenge launch disaster actually had a component of a shift work problem with sleep deprivation. Um, there were some individuals who were on that uh, launch team who actually felt that we shouldn't launch. Um, some of the people had missed some key warning signs and some of them were too tired uh, to really want to launch a argument uh, to support their concerns. And that was a, looking at the report, um, the, the actually uh, problem of the, the nighttime work schedule being fatiguing, leading to bad decision making. In our own work, looking at uh, medical personnel working around the clock, medical residents and nurses, the um, uh, poor eye-hand coordination related to self-sticks uh, with needle, uh, unprotected needles uh, for injecting is uh, uh, much more common in the night shift, when working night shift and day shift. And as I already talked about, highest rate of worker compensation injury events. Have to, uh, I'm not watching my watch, so Tomiko, if I'm going too slow, you speed me up, okay? Okay, so, um, this slide has a bunch of information on it, and I'll just say that uh, we can separate the type of conditions that people are going to have, and not everybody has them, and it happens also as a function of number of years or aging on a shift. By the way, if you're young and you get into shift work and you just don't like it or you can't tolerate it, you're gone in anywhere from three, three months to two years. Uh, those people who continue to do shift work, especially difficult shift work, are kind of self-selected superstars, uh, but they're still prone to having mental health effects and other biological effects over time. So we see in the mental health, we see uh, extra stress and anxiety. I mentioned depression, becoming a little neurotic, neurotic um, problems with vigilance, uh, burnout syndrome is really common. Um, and, and usually around the age of 45 to 55, individuals who um, are tolerant to, sh tolerant to shift work for all their early years, all of a sudden may start to complain of having problems sleeping, having digestive d disorders, having, um, uh, how should I say, uh, anger, expression, poor work performance. Per then they secondarily get so poor self-esteem and they no longer can do shift work. They have to leave and go to a day shift, and more and more industries are recognizing that and, and shifting them and finding workplace uh, day, daytime shift work. Um, cardiovascular disorders, uh, the literature, some literature suggests a 40% increase in risk for angina, coronary heart disease, high blood pressure, and risk for having a myocardial infraction, uh, infarction, and that it could include also a stroke. In women, um, the Shifting, those who are not taking birth control pills, uh, shifting from days to night uh, can have effects on uh, menstrual cycle duration and length, and, for, and in that case, uh, ovulation patterns. And in pregnant uh, women who are doing shift work, because we don't accept them, from, ex exempt them from doing shift work, they can do it if they wish, uh, prematurity is more common, as is low birth weight on delivery. Um, brain effects, uh, I already went into sleep loss, uh, reduction in deep sleep, more fatigue, more break, broken sleep spans and not continuous. And one study reports even reduced brain volume from doing shift work. Uh, more research needs to be done there. I've mentioned gastrointestinal disorders, um, dis indigestion, heartburn, uh, abdominal pain uh, from constipation and or actually development of peptic ulcer. And uh, another nice word for flatulence is just plain gas, okay? Um, 
And what's most concerning in recent years in the increased um, studies uh, finding epidemiologic wise in women increased breast cancer in men and women colorectal cancer as I mentioned before uh, and also a prostate cancer in males. Now the other problem I mentioned earlier that people who are, who are working shifts very often have medical conditions like the, take blood pressure medicines, um, thyroid, what have you. Uh, and uh, those of us who study circadian rhythms like me and are interested in the translational part I want to know if people take their medication at different times, morning versus evenings, do the medications work differently? And it turns out a whole lot of them do. So people who take the popular drug Valsartan, which is now a generic for treating uh, high blood pressure, most doctors, uh, most people prefer to take their medications at breakfast in the morning. But in reality, what we're starting to find is the most um, meaningful indicator of one's risk or for the diagnosis of hypertension and the risk of having a stroke or heart attack or developing coronary heart disease is not your daytime blood pressure that's measured in the doctor's clinic, but it's your asleep systolic, the high number blood pressure mean. And people who work uh, shift work nights when they shift over, all of a sudden they have an abnormally elevated blood pressure compared to when they were sleeping the nights before. So that increases the workload of the heart. It, it makes um, the risk for cardiovascular disease higher. Sorry to say that, it's true. And then so very often people develop hypertension from doing shift work because of poor nutrition habits. Uh, genetics is always there, but also the work schedule. And people start taking uh, medi medications. Now if they always took them when they woke up, uh, now they're maybe not only wake, waking up in the morning, now they're waking up in the middle of the night. And this slide shows that if you take your medicine, uh, Valsartan, uh, 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 either at 8 o'clock in the morning, or in this case, 8 o'clock at night, that there is different amounts of blood pressure reduction at different times a day, uh, according to how the drug behaves so differently because of different uh, uh, absorption, distribution, and hitting the targets of the circadian system where the drug works at a different biological time. So in certain people, um, this can mean loss of pr protection for throughout the full 24 hours. For some people, it may be producing hypotension with side effects of fatigue, dizziness, and poor decision making. So this is another problem with shift work. Now, getting to cancer. Um, in the 1970s, I became concerned about um, not only air and water pollution and noise pollution, but light pollution due to artificial light practices. And everybody thought I was a nutball, and maybe I was, I don't know. But, uh, but at any rate, um, others had the same concern uh, doing independent work, and one who has done a, a wonderful job is uh, uh, a fellow who's... Um, uh, name is uh, Stevens, Richard Stevens. Uh, I think he's at uh, in Connecticut. And he started looking at the epidemiology of, of cancer in shift workers, as did uh, Dr. Schoenharmer uh, and her group at, at Harvard in uh, at School of Public Health and, and School of Medicine. And a number of studies have shown that in nurses and also in um, women who are flight attendants who do um, transatlantic and transpacific uh, shifts, which are really doing shift work, that uh, they're getting light at night. Mother Nature did not expect us to get any more light at night except from stars and the full moon. And uh, so just showing you a few studies, Hansen and, and Lai, these studies were done over in Europe. And basically it shows women who are doing only night work have about a 50% on average uh, increase in risk for developing, developing breast cancer, uh, and nurses only uh, about 30%, and, uh, and uh, match controls that are also doing night work uh, also, um, I should say that those who are working more than six years, nurses are also at a very high risk. And the uh, study at the bottom also shows that uh, just cancers in general are of greater risk for people who do shift work as a career for a long duration, over 30 years. Uh, 
It starts increasing at year 15 of doing night work or rotating shift work, which you see light at night. Again, remember that slide, light at night inhibits melatonin. Melatonin, uh, I have one minute? <laughs> okay, I have to hurry up. Okay, so uh, melatonin is inhibited, and so you have the, the loss of protection of melatonin that prevents the development of cancer. The same is true of colorectal cancer, colon cancer, and rectal cancer. Uh, it's more common, and it's also uh, apparent more often after a threshold of about 15 years. And then finally, uh, just to give you a brief overview of the psychosocial issues, I don't have to go quickly, of fixed and night and rotating shift work, is um, complaints of insufficient time for hobbies, inability to attend daytime social functions with family members or on their own, difficulty attending to daily needs, daytime medical dental appointments, and not a lot of doctor's offices open in the middle of the night, going shopping, banking, investing, what have you. Difficulty and inability to attend daytime or evening children's school events or sporting events that most families would like to do together. A total disruption of family life and with the result often of discord between children, spouse and worker. A lot of divorces that are occurring and inability to attend or participate in favorite activities and organized sports. So um, here you have a person asked if he likes the, the work shift. He says, I work the night shift. How the hell do you want me to, how, how, do, how can you expect me to be at the meeting at 2 a.m.? And this is a, a psychosocial issue. And then finally, we have the, the circadian rhythm biological clock issues that, um, I'll skip this one, is that um, people are exposed in the workplace. Those who are exposed in the chemical industries or in different environments to things that Mother Nature never thought that we would be exposed to. And so, we have a different biological vulnerability um, during the night biology, if you will, versus the daytime biology. And so I've recently just uh, collected uh, 100 papers or so showing dramatic differences either in animal models or in human actual studies of differences in the risk for developing toxic reactions or severe reactions more on the night shift than on the day shift and also very often, the uh, conditions in the workplace are more, um, uh, how should I say, less clean, more toxic, because you have a different kind of workforce, that, you know, the people more oriented for the daytime to keep things clean, and during nighttime processing, you don't have the same staff, so you're actually exposed to higher concentrations, usually of things that can cause um, uh, adverse reactions, and your biology is less able to cope with them in the first place. So finally, as I say, around the age as I iterated, uh, or as I briefly mentioned earlier, that people who are really good at doing shift work, and I should say a lot of people who are actually biologically able to do shift work have a different biology. Uh, we can talk about the strength of the circadian time structure by the amplitude of shift uh, of, of each rhythm and, and the total time structure, and people who can easily do shift workers and, and travel overseas have a less strong lower amplitude of variation. Those people can do shift work, they can travel back and forth and they don't get much jet lag until about the age of 45 or 50 and all of a sudden as we age the prominence of our time structure degrades anyway and you get to the point where then everything gets mixed up like you're on jet lag all the time. So people who are tolerant to shift work all of a sudden at a later age find they can't do it anymore. They have a, develop a very severe shift work sleep disorder. They just can't sleep. They have to go to a day, day work or they have to go back to a normal diurnal activity schedule. They will not get better. Um, they can try sleeping pills. It doesn't work very well. Uh, they have, as I said, disturbed work performance. As I said earlier, results in lower self-esteem. They very often develop a mood disorder, which is rather severe. And that leads to disturbed relations with family, friends, and coworkers. And they also have uh, digestive systems. And at that time, they also have diabetes and other metabolic conditions, cardiovascular disease, and they just feel like hell. So uh, not everybody can do it. So in summary, uh, human beings are a diurnal species. They prefer to do work during the daytime and uh, sleep at night. Why not? Uh, however, in today's modern society, 
we have continuous processing, we need security, we need good people all around us, we need firefighters, ambulance personnel, medical staff, and that requires that we have people available to support society and societal needs throughout the 24-hour time span, and that requires rotating and permanent night shift work schedules that result in repeated disruption of our circadian rhythms plus inhibition of melatonin secretion by light at night uh, uh, exposure which uh, can lead to all kinds of health effects as I went into. So I've already said that in summary, we can have permanent night shift uh, being associated, also rotating night shift being associated with greater acute and chronic health effects, um, uh, reduced cognitive performance and decision making when having to be called upon to make very important decisions, sometimes life versus death ones in the middle of the night. And um, a night shift work, uh, work uh, poses possible increased industrial toxicity risk. And then consequence of sleep deprivation coupled with light at night exposure. Uh, we need to do uh, more research uh, to further understand uh, the impact on actual shift workers and also the new type of workers working at home who also now are truly, without knowing it, uh, shift workers or night workers in a fixed way. So I thank you for your attention. I hope I can take a few questions with the allotted time. Yes? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. Um, hi, I'm here, maybe many of us are. I'm here for my brother who should be sleeping. He's a shift worker. And he specifically asked me to ask, is there any, I don't know if there's been studies, like if you sleep three hours and then later sleep four hours, like is that worse if he's having to break up his sleep? He's also been a three-year-old. Okay, um, so the Okay, so the question is, um, I think your, your fundamental question is, uh, is it best to try to get all your sleep in one shift, if you will, or one continuous span, or can you break it up? Um, well, let's put it this way. If you can't get a continuous span of sleep, and that's your only option to break it up, then that's better than nothing. However, What's not realized is during usual sleep is a lot of things happen um, that are connected with the different sleep stages, with dreaming and light sleep. So under ordinary conditions like people who are active during the daytime and, and, and working a nine to five shift but sleeping at night, when they're sleeping at night, the different sleep stages are triggering, for example, in males, um, the production of testosterone it's gating the hormones that control blood pressure and differentiate hypertension versus normal tension. During the nighttime, normal nighttime span, our immune system is activated to prepare us for our normal activity span. Um, thyroid hormone, um, the adrenal hormones of stress and so forth. So by splitting up the sleep, you're disrupting the other higher frequency sleep rhythms that are tied to supportive health functions that in the long term come back and haunt the shift worker who splits, who is sleep deprived and also has to break up their sleep schedule. Now, mothers when they give birth and fathers when they have you know, kids at home, that's a short term issue. And uh, that's not a chronic issue that can lead to long term negative effects. But, uh, in the case of the cancer, melatonin, if your brother does that for many years, um, the increased risk for developing it as a male, a prostate cancer, and depending on his genetics, colorectal cancer, um, are real factors. And also, I should say, arterial sclerosis and other metabolic conditions, including type 2 diabetes. Any other questions? Yes. The question is about the uh, the question is about CBDs. Um, how did you know that? Um, actually, um, there's a lot of talk about CBDs, and CBDs is uh, uh, the, uh, I I have a very significant interest in that area, and uh, with my colleague, we're going to be starting uh, some real medical trial outcome trials. Uh, with uh, medical doctors looking at treating 
medical conditions of um, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, um, ALS, um, and um, because the uh, CBDs um, are useful for modulating the immune system and the nervous system and the inflammatory system. And uh, we don't know, but we're going to be doing CBD trials and we're going to be administering them at certain, certain circadian times. Now, with regard to your question, individuals, young people who are doing night work, uh, I didn't have time to go into it, but they can get away with a lot of things that you can't get away on the day shift. So you have more uh, drug of abuse activities going on in the night shift. Uh, there's more sexual harassment that goes on during the night shift and goes unreported. And you have more CBD use and also uh, THC use. And so, um, and other uh, drugs of uh, not my choice, if you will. So um, uh, there, there are some real issues that we need to sort out that are um, uh, uh, problems for society in general, but because of the sh shift work scenario, where people can get away with things because there's less supervision. Uh, it's problematic, not just CPDs, but uh, the whole scenario there. Any other, do you, do you gentlemen have any, yeah? Yeah, I do have a question about uh, night shift. Is it better to have a straight or a fixed night shift versus the, the rotation? And then the effect of going back to sleeping at night on your days off? Yeah, um, okay. Um, okay, if, if you're single and you don't have a lot of demands, a straight night shift is good. There's a lot of people who are um, introverts and they love the night shift. They don't want to be interacting with people, they don't have that personality. Um, so they like to do their job, they do it well, they do it at night, and when they go home, they don't want to. They're not big social animals. They may not have a family. And they can, they're, they're pretty regimented. If you're that way, you can sleep. And that's really good. You minimize a lot of these problems. Now, it, when you're rotating, going back and forth, that's when things become complicated. Because, see, when you're sleeping during the daytime, like in that previous scenario I gave you, generally people will darken their bedroom. So when they're sleeping during our daytime, it's dark in the room. They're biologically adjusted to a sleep by day, work by night. So they have the normal melatonin secretion at, in the daytime, which is their nighttime now. And so they don't have the cancer risks that the other rotating shift worker would have because they're flip-flapping and getting light at the wrong biological time. And they're also not disrupting the other circadian rhythms which lead to other problems with efficient nutrition and some of the other medical conditions that can develop uh, more easily with a disrupted circadian 24-hour time structure repeatedly over one's lifetime. Uh, have I answered your well, question? Yeah, you have. So I, I believe you said the fixed shift is better, but what about on the days off? Ah. And then they go back to trying to sleep back. Uh, that's, that is tough. It depends uh, how regimented it is. Even in college students who are diurnally active and, uh, and supposedly sleeping at night, they like to party on the weekends, and so do young people. So they may go out to restaurants, bars, sporting events where there's artificial light. The light is seen by the eye. It's the signal is transferred to the clock and the melatonin, the by, by, uh, timekeeping system. And that system thinks if you're partying Friday night and Saturday night, late at night with light, they think that you just took a flight from, let's say, uh, Washington, D.C. to L.A. And then you got to get up Monday morning if you got the early morning shift and you say, oh, I feel like hell. Yeah, because your body thinks you're now in L.A. You're not in Washington <laughs> going to work. So that's what's called a social jet lag. And te nowadays, you can get enough light from your iPhone, iPad, and TV to actually simulate enough light that your biology thinks you're in a different time zone and it's consistently shifting you. And although um, I talked about the home worker now more doing type of shift work in the home environment, 
We're starting now with preschoolers giving them iPads, kindergartners, and they're getting light. The kids are doing their homework assignments off uh, iPads at night, and they're basically exposed to kind of a, a night shift, and they have trouble going to sleep, and they're sleep deprived, and they don't perform in school as well. And, the, and I don't know what will be the health consequences in 20 years in terms of uh, endocrine-related uh, reproductive biology, uh, tissue-related cancers. I have no idea, but it's scary, very scary, and also metabolic disorders, because when, you, uh, when you're tired and you can't go to sleep, you have a biological motivation to eat. I don't know if you feel that or not. I, I've actually... I've, I've done quite a bit of research on that. So, um, in fact, when we do around-the-clock medical studies on patients, we bring 20 in and we have me medical residents, I just go out and buy apple pies and all kinds of snack be uh, because it's all night long. They're snacking, these young people. And uh, that's what happens when you don't get sleep, and that's a way to get instant nutrition, uh, sugar breakdown to keep the system going. And so... Um, uh, with these kids that are using these iPads, young adults, uh, they are eating more snack foods at night, not necessarily healthy ones. So I kind of got off the subject there, but uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a something, it's, a, it's an issue our society has to come uh, to terms with. The American Medical Association has issued warnings. Um, the National Toxicology Program, NIOSH, I've been working with, and by the way, NIOSH is really your go-to government agency for the shift work uh, uh, research and recommendations. They're doing work on firefighters as well as policemen and, and, and doctors and nurses. But we have a lot to learn, and um, I didn't mention it. It's, the, it's more the blue spectrum of the, of the total light that we see that is most uh, biologically active in inhibiting melatonin. And that is the, the spectrum of, uh, of light that is most energy efficient. So we're seeing more lights in, uh, in the metropolitan areas, in homes, that are blue light spectrum. And everybody's saying, hey, look, we're saving the environment. Yeah, we're killing off the human race, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and I, didn't go, I didn't go into it, but... Um, uh, the glasses will help, yeah, and that's why you know, some people think it's pretty uh, phony, but um, a quality, there are glasses that will shield the blue light and protect, you're, you're, very, you're correct, and that can be helpful to shift workers uh, as well as regular people. Um, I didn't have time to mention it, uh, but I'll take the time now. Um, in young women who are not taking birth control pills, um, Light is a very important factor in, in uh, controlling or influencing the length of the menstrual cycle and ovula ovulation. And um, there actually is a patent, if you go through the library here, on the use of light, uh, bedroom light, uh, on, uh, for women who have very abnormal long menstrual cycles and they're infertile. They can use a 75-watt light bulb on their bed stand overnight on days 13 through 17 of their menstrual cycle and after two months can almost normalize a very, very abnormal menstrual cycle into normality and increase the probability of uh, a desired uh, impregnation, conception. So in the opposite way, artificial light at the wrong times can elongate and disrupt menstrual cycles. And we've done some studies in women living in caves without uh, a light exposure except uh, special light that uh, they put on when needed, uh, not rich in blue. And their menstrual cycles are altered. And, uh, and we've done some other studies. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things I didn't have time to go into, but our biology is, uh, you know, we evolved in in an environment that was very cyclic with light, dark patterns, noise and quiet, cool and hot, what have you. And our biology has adapted through the biological clock network to be synchronized to the environment for optimal efficiency, both in cognitive function, physical function, and metabolic function. And Mother Nature, when Edison created the light bulb, everybody said, Eureka! And all of a sudden, society was freed because, you know, 
when lights went down at night, what did you have, what, 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 what was left to do? Uh, we had, uh, you can burn, uh, make a fire, use a gas lamp, not very powerful for reading, um, didn't have television, didn't have iPads, didn't have I, uh, iPhones, smartphones. And so um, society became very different. And so our experiences with artificial light uh, and electricity, which made more prevalent shift work because of continuous process, growth of society, 24-hour society, we've only had really about four to five generations of humans that have experienced so-called light at night and abnormal eating. Our, our ancestors didn't eat at night. Our ancestors got up and they went hunting, and killed a squirrel or maybe ate berries. <laughs> and, um, and our brain, our whole biology was organized that we store sugary uh, moieties in our liver as gl called glycogen. So even before we wake up, that glycogen start, is broken down and you start getting sugar circulating because the, the clock knows you're gonna get up and you need to have some energy for our ancestors had to go out and pick berries and do stuff. Well, when you're doing shift work, all that stuff is fouled up on the preparation for optimal biological performance. And so um, uh, we don't know what's uh, gonna be the end result. We're seeing cancers, we're seeing obviously more depression, mental disorders, and people with depression and certain other medical disorders are highly influenced by light, light spectrum, as it interacts with sleep. And sleep and mood are so tied together. Uh, we're seeing a lot of mental disease. I'm sure you see it as well, and you're having to deal with it. And so we, we don't know. This is a, a salient problem that we take for granted. It's, oh, light, it's wonderful. Look what we can do as a society. And that's why I said uh, air, water, and then I got into light pollution. And I said, hey, this guy's, <laughs> uh, but it's everywhere. It's, most, it's mo one of the most prevalent polluters in the world, and it's everywhere, in your home, outside your home, in your workplace. So anyway, I'm getting the signal with the hook. <laughs> so All right, so th really, thanks a lot for your interest and your questions. Thank you. If you have continuing questions, you can come up after the program, but I'd just like to thank Dr. Skolensky for that very, I would say, erudite thank you. explanation thank you. of the circadian clock. Yeah. It raises a lot of questions in my head and yes. other people. Okay. So thank you. Okay, we thank you. expect you to come back. I want to hear about that ECS uh, yeah. and cannabinoid um, research, and uh, we definitely need to come back.